On August 19th, there's an informational meeting for Safe Families for Children. So whether you signed up or not, please come to the meeting just to find out more about the different roles that you can play in this particular ministry. It's at 12.30 in the bridge on August 19th. August 26th has been set aside for Baptism Sunday. If you've invited Christ in your life, whether very recently or at some time in the past, and you have not yet been baptized and would like to be, then please fill out one of the cards in the pew in front of you with your name and contact information. Indicate baptism on the back and we'll get the information to you as quickly as we possibly can. We'll give you a phone call and make arrangements for you to be able to be baptized on Sunday, August the 26th. Hello, ladies. Saturday, September 1st is our Women's Summer Event. Amy Barnes will be joining us for an evening filled with laughter, fun, and fellowship. We're also gonna have ice cream and door prizes, and we're gonna raffle off a Choose Joy quilt. So don't miss it, it's gonna be a lot of fun. The tickets are $15. Come that evening and bring a friend. Hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Bill. And I'm Lindsay. We host college and young adults Bible study at our home every Thursday night. The Bible study usually starts around 7, 7.15, and we usually end around 8.30. You can come early, hang out, and then afterwards, we usually have dessert and kids just stick around and talk. It's a safe place to come and delve into God's Word with people of your own age. Love to have you there. Thank you. Men's Breakfast is coming up the second Saturday of the month. Starts at 8 o'clock, coffee's on at 7.30. So come along and enjoy some good food and fellowship. September 9th is going to be a very special day for us at New Hope. Over the last 10 years, we have been engaged in ministry in the Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire of Africa. Uh, we have taken a team in every year for the last 10 years to share with 1040i and Mike Cousineau. They are going to be with us on September the 9th for all three of our Sunday morning services and our Sunday evening service. If you want to know more about what's going to take place this next February, I hope you'll come and join us that Sunday. We have a Thursday morning men's Bible study. It meets at 6 a.m. and it concludes at 6.45. So if you're retired, you get up early, you can go home and take a nap. If you are part of the working group, uh, we get you out of here in time to, to get to the job. But we're gonna be kicking off a brand new study the Thursday after Labor Day. So if you are looking for a place to connect, if you're looking to get better acquainted with other men, if you're looking to do a deeper Bible study, we would love to have you check out Thursday morning early morning Bible study, 6 to 6.45 every single Thursday. Family nights are starting again. Wednesday, September the 12th, there'll be adult and kids Bible studies. The kids this session are going to spend seven weeks learning about the life of Jacob through various slime experience. So we're going to make lots of slime. That's for our preschool through fourth grade students. And of course, our fifth and sixth graders are still meeting every week as well. If you're a parent and you're dropping off a kid for the kids' studies, or you're just an adult that wants to go to a Wednesday night adult Bible study, then I'll be doing Forgotten God by Francis Chan. It's a chance to talk about the Holy Spirit and find out how we can re-engage with the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that goes from 7 to 8, the same time as the kids' sessions. We also have dinner at 6.15 for anyone that wants to come that's going to these Bible studies. To get more information on these and other upcoming events, visit newhopechurch.net. All right, we're going to take uh, just a brief moment and open with a word of prayer. Uh, Larry Calvert, who was sitting right up here, had to uh, step out. Uh, not exactly sure what's going on. He didn't want to talk much at the moment. He's having some, uh, some chest pains, I think, uh, seemed to be the indication that we were getting. And so his wife's going to call us back and let us know in a little while what's going on. But I just want to take a brief moment and pray for Larry, all right? Father, you know things that we uh, know nothing about. And I'm sure there's a variety of other needs going on, even at this very moment as we're praying. But Lord, I just uh, I commit to you Larry's needs. When we greeted this morning, uh, he did not look uh, like he was at the top of his game today. And uh, obviously isn't. You know the things that are going on right now within him. And so we just pray that um, they will make good choices about next steps. And we just pray for your will to be done in and through them. We commit this to you in the name of Christ. Amen.
and amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to New Hope. It is our pleasure to welcome you here today. If you are a guest, thank you for choosing New Hope as your place of worship. There are some cards in the pew. We'd love for you to fill that out. We make some promises that we're not going to harass you, but we'd love to get that information and respond and let you know as much as we can about New Hope Church. Let me highlight a couple of other things, and then we'll talk about a few prayer requests. One is I've got a, um, a couple of clipboards up here to send around. The first one uh, is about financial peace. If you'd like to take that class that they talked about uh, on screen, it starts September the 16th, goes through November the 25th. The Sloans will be facilitating that. They, ha- they are alumni of financial peace, and they pursue it with a passion in their own finances. And so you've got some great facilitators. If you'd like to sign up for that class, it'll be meeting on Sunday afternoons. Please put the information on here so they can follow up with you. Also, there is a sign-up sheet for the Tuesday evening women's Bible study. It's led by Nan Isom. They'll be studying the book of Ecclesiastes, and they would like to have enough material available for you as that for, for you that night as well. So please sign up. If you have already signed up in the past, you don't need to sign up again. All right? Tonight, 5 o'clock, Sunday evening worship over in the bridge. Our associate pastor, Mark Addis, is preaching a three- to four-week series. It is called Kingdom Culture. Uh, how when God preached the Sermon on the Mount, he turned the culture of that time upside down. And the message of the Sermon on the Mount still turns our culture upside down. Last week, uh, he looked at the Beatitudes, and this week he's going to take us beyond the Beatitudes in the next steps that are found in the Sermon on the Mount. We had a great time last Sunday night. Hope you'll come and join us. It's five to six. There's some worship. There's a little bit of sharing uh, with those who are there. Uh, There is coffee and water always available during the service. And if you want to stay for some Q&A afterwards, some small group breakup, they do that. But there's an in-between time that if you've, uh, uh, if you've had your can full in the first hour, you can go home, all right? Or you can go get some ice cream. But uh, there is a time for discussion afterwards. So love to see you tonight at 5.30. Fawn, uh, there's Fawn. Fawn, stand up, all right? All right. Oh, five, did I say 5.30? 5 o'clock for service tonight, all right? 5 o'clock. Fawn, stand back up. All right. Fawn, you're going to be out in the pavilion, right? Yes, yeah, and, and I are out there uh, after each service. You and who? Maureen. Maureen. Maureen, stand up so I know who you are. All right, there we go. All right, there we go. And what are you doing out there? And how much are the raffle tickets? Raffle tickets are a dollar each or my hike for 20. Now, I counted them. You get 36 tickets for 20 bucks a deal. And you can go along every day. So I suggest doing that one. But if you want to buy one, two, five, ten, you can do that too. Okay, very good. Uh, I was asked a very important question in the last service. And I made up an answer. (laughs) What's the size of that quilt? Okay. I said about four by six. Actually, it was a lady who asked me. Here's what I can tell you in this service. It's that size. Whatever that is. Uh Uh-oh, got a guy with a tape measure. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> so, is it four? Oh, he's got to get his glasses out first. <laughs> this doesn't happen in other churches, folks. It's only at New Hope does this happen. That's four. That's four foot. I was right. Four foot. That better be six. Ah, oh, five foot. I was off a foot. All right. Four by five. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's because it's on the stand. That's right. That's right. All right. Terrific. Thank you guys for all your help. All right. We got that nailed down. 
Hey, next Sunday will be very exciting. Baptism Sunday. And Tim Kepler is back from Japan. All right? So he'll be back engaging with us in worship next Sunday as well. Uh, okay, before I catch you up on prayer requests, because what I'm going to share is also a prayer request, I have uh, a letter to read to you this morning. Uh, dear Pastor Tim, Elder Board, and Congregation, it is with great sadness that I'm offering my letter of resignation as your youth pastor. The past three years in which I've served teens and families of the church have been an experience filled with growth and love, one which I will always cherish. However, after much prayer and seeking God's best, I've decided to trust Him and see what the next step of faith for me are and to leave new hope at this time. I haven't taken this decision lightly. Some of you will recall uh, he, he had taken two weeks off, all right, for thought and prayer over this decision. I'm nervously excited about the next season for my family and for new hope. God is good and God is God, and He's totally sufficient. He is going to do some amazing things. Thank you again for allowing me to be part of your lives and your friendship and your support. You will always be family. I wish all of you blessings and love, grace and peace, Chris Bishop. This was placed on my desk on Monday afternoon, the 13th. Um, for you parents, on September the 10th, I believe that is a Monday. I just got this email last night. There will be a parent meeting, all right? And so we would love to have you show up. And I think there's going to be dinner is that correct, Teddy? I'm looking for a nod. Yes. Parents, dinner will be available for you, and the parent meeting will be at 6.30. So we would love to have you come, and we'll talk more about the future. Uh, we've been very blessed to have a wonderful volunteer staff working in our youth department, and uh, they've already met, made plans, a calendar for the rest of the year. So um, our kids are going to be in good shape with uh, not a lot of change, all right, with uh, the current leadership that is left behind. And so would love to address any of your questions or concerns about the future with those parents on September the 10th. So I needed to share that with you this morning. Um, Monday was a day of, of mixed blessings. I received that letter on Monday, and at the same time, I was bouncing back and forth between church and the hospital. Uh, on Monday, uh, our daughter-in-law and son blessed us with our second grandchild. And so his name is Brooks Dallas, Brooks with an S on the end of it, Dallas with an S on the end of it, Roland with no S on the end of it. And uh, he entered this world at 8 pounds, 13 ounces. I would show you the first picture I was sent, but my wife has told me I can't show that one anymore. Um, he's a boy. If he ever has a gender identity crisis, I have the picture to clear it all up for him, all right? But uh, Shelly puts the nice ones on Facebook, all right? So if you want to see what he looks like. But uh, the first thing he wanted to do at 8 pounds, 13 ounces was eat. And uh, that's about all he's wanted to do ever since then. So he's born into the right family because the Rollins love to eat. Uh, but all is going well, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, as the Lord gives, the Lord also takes away. And uh, the following day, uh, Johnny Miller from our church, who started his battle in cancer at the very beginning of the year, um, he and Jeannie decided it was time for Heinz Hospice to take over. And at 1030 on Tuesday morning, they picked Johnny up and took him to Heinz Hospice home. And um, uh, Johnny, where, where's Steve? Steve, where are you? I know you're in here. Oh, right here. Yeah, you're too close to me. Um, I know that your dad was very generous, but I also know from your mom he could be a little tight at times. And so he demonstrated that on Tuesday. Uh, he checked in at about 10.30 in the morning, and he decided he was not going to waste a lot of money at Heinz Hospice, all right? And he went to heaven at about 5 o'clock that afternoon. Jeannie was with him. It was very peaceful. Much of the family had been with him all day. Most of them had just been gone for 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, and just he and Jeannie in the room, uh, he went to be with Jesus. Uh, he was very courageous in his battle, very outspoken about his faith to his doctors, his nurses, and anybody who came to visit. And so uh, that celebration of life for John Miller is going to be not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. 
uh, at 1030 right here in the sanctuary with a reception following at the Veterans Building. So please be praying for Steve and Kim and Steve's sister and her husband, the rest of the family, and uh, also thank God for his kindness to John through this entire process. Um, also in the hospital this week has been Marianne Levendusky. Her and John were diagnosed about the same time with their cancers. Uh, she went through treatment. Uh, the tumors all shrank. Uh, she went to Stanford, if you recall, at the beginning of summer, had surgery. When we visited her up there, the doctor said, this is as close to saying somebody is cancer-free who's had cancer as we can be. And so that was great, great news. Um, the follow-up to that is this past week they discovered tumors are coming back. And they were starting to make a plan to treat those tumors because they had responded very, very well to the treatment the first time. Before they could start that, though, her kidneys failed. And so she's been at Clovis Community for about five days. Uh, went to see her again yesterday, and uh, they were releasing her um, with, uh, with tubes in her kidneys. Her kidneys started functioning again and are working, so she's able to go home. She may have those tubes for the rest of her life to assist her kidneys. But next week, they will start uh, at some point a new plan to treat the tumors. So continue to pray for the Levin Dusky family from, from our church. Um, let's see here. There's a couple of other. Oh, for the Parker family, we had the service yesterday for Jason, Greg and Shelley's 30, uh, 38-year-old son uh, from Washington. And we had his memorial service here yesterday. Uh, it was a wonderful celebration of his life and a great time for a lot of extended family and friends who are like family to be together. And uh, it was a wonderful day. The great news is Jason had written out his own testimony of his faith in Jesus Christ. And that was huge for the Parker family, all right? Huge for the Parker family. And so uh, particularly for Greg's dad, Jason's grandfather, who uh, has resisted that message for a long, long time, but in recent days has been a little more open to that. And it was a good day for all of them. So just continue to pray for them. Let me see if I had any other additional notes I needed. Frank Hicks, uh, continue to pray for him. Uh, all kinds of challenges going there. But recently, uh, things seem to be a bit better in the last day or two. And so just continue to remember him. The Sloans from our church, their daughter had breast cancer surgery this week. They got the best news they could possibly get. And so we're grateful for that. Pathology will not be back till next week, but the doctors believe everything is clear. They didn't have to take any lymph nodes because there was no evidence of cancer there in the testing they did during the surgery. And so it's as good as it possibly can be. So uh, those are the updates. And then I have one new one today. The Wright's daughter, Wright's Wave. There are two of our tallest people in church <laughs> on the inside. All right. <laughs> Uh, but their daughter, Luann, she lives in Colorado. She's been diagnosed with stage 3 to possibly stage 4 breast cancer. Um, she's been on some medication for quite a while for arthritis, and so that has created some uh, liver issues, all right, as they take these next step of treatment. If I understand Shelly right up here, you all are flying out to go see your daughter as soon as you can come. All right. And so uh, just be praying for the rights as they sit and wait. That's the hardest place to do. And uh, just be remembering to pray for them. And their, da their daughter's name is Luann. And um, I know they would love and appreciate your prayers. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our tithes and offerings today. And would you join with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, the, the joy and the privilege to be able to humble our hearts and to either bow or lift our heads towards you in conversation is a wonderful and incredible privilege and honor. And I just say thank you for the opportunity that we have, whether it's private or whether it's public in a corporate setting like a church family whether it's just one of us praying to you or whether it's all of us praying to you. you. You just afford to us and give to us and provide for us this awesome conversation with you. We have the privilege of listening to you out of the Scriptures. We have the privilege of listening to your presence in us and the person of your Holy Spirit as 
as he brings to our attention scriptures and biblical principles and truths that we need to apply at any given moment. And then out of the truth that we know about the Bible and our willingness to apply that truth, we then can visit with you and talk with you. Today we bring to you a host of needs from health to family matters to church concerns. We lift up Chris and Melody to you, Lord, and what those next step are. There's a sense that you have something else for them. May they recognize your leadership and your handiwork. And Father, that means you have next steps for us and give us the wisdom to follow your leadership there. Father, there are those whose lives have been challenged by death. And yet, as we have been studying your scriptures about heaven, we understand that um, death is not the end, but it's the beginning of something greater than the good we've ever had. And so, Lord, just give us clarity and understanding in all these matters and other things that happen in our world. Father, I pray that personally we walk in great fellowship with you and then collectively as a church, not because the size of the church is important, but Father, the growing of our faith is important. And that faith has grown in not only our private study of your word, but also in our public understanding and application of the word as as individual people join together as the body of Christ called the church. The world can see in and through our imperfections your perfecting of us. And through our imperfections, they will see a perfect God who loves and cares about his family and who cares about expanding his family to include them as well. So enable us, Father, in this process of everyday life to remember we are your children and just as our own personal family has found great delight in seeing it grow this week, you find great delight every day in seeing your family grow. And your heart is so big that when others are added to the family, you do not have less love for us. You just give us greater love for those you've added to your family. Thank you for what you do and how you do it so well the privilege of giving and sharing, Father, we say thanks. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. This past uh, Friday evening, our uh, Hope Group directors, Teddy and Corey, they helped sponsor a uh, night at the movies here at the church. And I'm going to say, I don't know if you guys got to count, 120, 130 folks were here uh, Friday night, sitting right out here watching the big screen, uh, the movie I Can Only Imagine, and it was awesome. It was terrific. I've, second time I've seen it, and uh, it was really, really good. Uh, we also had concessions. They had popcorn and hot dogs and milk duds, just like you're supposed to have at the movie. And uh, we also had a little bonus. We had a, one, of our, uh, one of our high school kids who graduated, and uh, this summer worked at Hume. Uh, Stone is here. All right. He's another one of our high school grads who worked at uh, Hume. We had five of our graduating seniors who got hired uh, by Hume Lake to work, and they worked in a variety of areas from, you know, uh, kitchen to kitchen to kitchen. I think they all worked in the kitchen in some form of capacity. Uh, but anyway, I did a great job. Uh, and while she was up there, her, her intent was to come back, uh, start college this fall. And uh, some folks suggested to her that she check out the Joshua program, uh, which is an extended Bible study program for a year. And uh, she resisted it, uh, kind of kept being nudged, she felt like, by the Lord to consider it. And finally, some friends just said, fill out the application. They only accept 42 people anyway, and there's 300 people applying. Uh, leave it in God's hands. Well, she did that, and uh, she was chosen. Um, and so, um, and the all right part of that is that's really cool. The not so all right part of it is it's about 15 grand. Uh, and so, anyway, the... Um, uh, the concessions from Friday evening uh, all went to help her with some of those uh, unexpected, God-directed expenses for her to go to 
one year of Bible training and uh, in-depth study. She'll get to work at Hume again next year, pay part of her expenses for that off. And so I think uh, they told me we raised a little over $500, all right, in concessions last Friday evening. And if anybody else is so inclined to want to assist in that, you could just put a little something in the offering, which we've already taken, but you can hand it to the ushers. And uh, if, if you make it to New Hope, but if you write on the envelope, uh, write Ivy, Okay, we'll know what that means. You can write poison ivy if you would like, all right? If you're a Batman fan, that will make sense to you if you're not, but she's the non-poisonous variety, all right? Uh, but a wonderful heart and a passion for the Lord. So uh, Stone will be leaving in September uh, to become a doctor, okay, up at UC Davis. So we're excited. Uh, we've already sent one back east. Uh, one's going to build ships, all right? So you just have no idea what God's going to do with these kids who graduate out of our high school program. And uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, so small groups, hope groups, if you would like to join a hope group, all right, there are some cards in the pew in front of you that say hope groups, I believe, on them. They're the smaller cards. If you don't find one by where you are, use one of the big cards, put your name on it. If you've never, that, yep, Corey's holding one up there, it looks like that, all right, all right. And uh, fill one out. Uh, in September, uh, we're going to be launching uh, with two couples, the Drakes uh, and the Rollins are going to be launching, um, we hope, maybe a couple of small groups. It'll start as one big one, possibly. Uh, we'll be meeting probably in our homes uh, on Wednesday evening. If it gets too big, we might have to find another place to meet. But what we'll do is it'll be about a seven or eight week study. And if there's 10, 12, 25, anyway, at the end of that study, we will launch one, two, or three small groups. All right? Does that make sense? So if you've not been plugged into a small group uh, or yours has withered on the vine and is not meeting anymore, uh, take one of those small group cards and say, hey, interested in the small group starting in September. We'll uh, be getting information and sign-ups out about the exact time, place, and location uh, in the next week or two. All right? But that will launch sometime in September. Uh, I'm going to invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today. I have great news for you if you've been here the last three weeks. The great news is we're out of hell. <laughs> In fact, this week I said to hell with hell, all right? Um, we are not talking about hell hardly anymore, all right? The series is about heaven and uh, we've, we've spent a lot of weeks looking at heaven, and we've looked at death, and we've looked at hell, and we're going to take the next few weeks and wrap up our uh, answers to questions about the subject of heaven. And I understand that in all of these various sermons, we've touched on various questions. Some of them we've been very specific about. Uh, others, when you answer one question, it connects to another. So I know there's a little bit of repetition that takes place in here, uh, but this particular uh, Sunday and probably next, we're going to be answering two or three questions that are closely connected, and that is, will we know one another in heaven? What, is the, what, are, what are we going to look like in heaven? What's our bodies going to be like? Uh, those are questions that came in at the very beginning of this study uh, that you said you would like answers to. And so that's what we're going to explore today. Um, I found out something that I find out almost on a weekly basis, and that is I'm not going to finish the sermon today. It will follow through. Eight o'clock, prove that. So we'll be part two next week. Um, I don't often read long Scripture passages on Sunday mornings, but I am today because I think if I had to pinpoint an importance one chapter out of the entire Bible that might be, and, and this is a hard thing to say, because the entire Bible is important. But in terms of foundational, this one chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 may be the most, most significant important because of what it covers. And a little background here. The Corinthian church was a messed up church. Okay, I just got to say it kind of like it is. Uh, you guys know what the epistles are in the New Testament? I, some, that's not a rhetorical question. Do you know what the epistles are? Yeah, they're called the letters. Um, several tests have been distributed at various times in Bible college and sometimes even in church, you know, 20 questions about the Bible. And uh, frequently the question, what's an epistle? The most frequent answer given in Bible college is the wives of the apostles. 
that is not true. The epistles are not the wives of the apostles, all right? The epistles are letters of the apostles written to first century churches. You have to understand, first century churches did not have a New Testament yet to read. They were still reading the Old Testament and they were then following the teachings of the apostles. Okay? Because the resurrection of Jesus had just happened. So all of this is brand new. God was still pinning out through his apostles the rest of the Bible, Matthew to Revelation. And so, particularly after the book of Acts, which is the founding of the first century church, moving from the temple of, of Judaism to the living organism called the church that was sprouting up in homes all over the place. And so after the resurrection of Christ, as, as the, the, the apostles, the disciples, fulfilled the great commission of going into all the world and preach the gospel, the gospel had not yet been completed. Ooh, I just sounded better. Ooh. Thanks, guys. And... Um, and so the disciples were going on missionary trips and journeys, and they were planting churches and wherever God was sending them. And there was a church in Corinth, and Corinth was a very metropolitan place. We might call it like the Boston of the U.S., all right? Very metropolitan. And uh, cultures of all kinds were there. And Paul had built this church from the ground up, it was a church plant. And then God moved him on to plant other churches. But as pastors are prone to do, when they plant a church and move on and do it again, they, they still love that baby. They care about its health. And word had gotten to Paul that the church in Corinth, which had exploded in size, was now beginning to be influenced by the multiple cultures of the community and they were beginning to add things to the foundational faith that Paul had taught them. And they were going off in gross error. They were making decisions and creating doctrines and church practices that weren't built on the truth of who Jesus was, but was built upon their relationships and their experiences. It's kind of like the story I told yesterday at Jason's service. There was a there was a keen who was with a group of hunters out in the countryside, and they were hunting. And as they were walking through the woods, the keen noticed that there were these trees that, that, that had an arrow embedded right in the middle of a bullseye in the trunk of the trees. And he came across eight or ten of these, and he was amazed at the marksmanship of, of, of that hunter with his bow and arrow because every single one of them was right in the heart of the bullseye. And he said, i got to find that guy. He's got to become part of my hunting team. And so the hunting team now stopped looking for game and started looking for a hunter. And in about an hour, they came around a corner and over a hill and looked down, and here was a, a, a young lad walking away from a tree, arrow buried right in the middle of that tree trunk, right in the middle of the bullseye. And, and the king ran up to him and said, young man, come here, come here. I want to know. Did you shoot those arrows or did you just walk up and plant the arrow in the tree? And the young man said, yes, sir, Mr. Keene, I was a hundred paces from every tree when I let my arrow go. And the Keene said, man, I want you on my team. Will you become part of my hunting crew? He said, I would be honored. And he said, I am just so amazed that at a hundred paces, every single time, you bury it right in the middle of the bullseye. And the young man and said, oh, oh, Keen, that's not exactly the way it went. He said, a hundred paces I stood away. I aimed right for the middle of the trunk. I let the arrow go. That arrow landed in the trunk of the tree. And he said, then I walk up and paint the bullseye around the tree. <laughs> and as funny as that is about target practice, the sad thing is, is that's the way many people in our culture today create their theology. It's the way they create the purpose of their life. 
It's based upon their feelings and their circumstances and their culture, and they create a spiritual picture, a spiritual bullseye, and every time they hit it, because they can move the bullseye. But Paul is going to let us know, like he did the Corinthian church, that is not the way that you build your life. So let's read this chapter, and it's a long one. And as you know, I'll pause and make comments occasionally through our journey. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you. See, he had already preached it, and he needed to remind them. That means it's okay for me to repeat sermons at church. <laughs> this is what you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. Not by another one. By this gospel. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. I don't know about you guys, but first importance sounds more important than all the other importance. Now, don't misunderstand me. All of the Bible is important, but there are some essentials that we cannot waver on, and that is what Paul is telling the Corinthian church because they had been wavering. In fact, it's to these folks, he says, you can't waver. You can't be tossed about by every wind of doctrine that comes. Here is what is of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the what? Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, I just told you a few minutes ago the New Testament hadn't been written yet. So what's the Scriptures Paul talks about? This is the Old Testament. He said... This does not change. What Jesus did in his life was what was prophesied and predicted in the Old Testament. He did not live his life and then paint a bullseye around it and make it look like he was a perfect shot. These things were done well in advance. The bullseye had already been painted, and in the life and activities of Jesus Christ, he fulfilled them dead on. And this is what we build our life on, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, he was buried and raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and then he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and after that to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. What, what Paul is telling them is, hey guys, not only did he show it to the apostles, but to 500 other people walking the streets of Jerusalem, Jesus showed himself, and they are still alive, most of them. A few have died. But you can go check this out. You can talk to eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus. Verse 7, and then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. For I am the least abnormally born. That simply means I wasn't around Jesus while he was living. I did not see him that first day or two after his resurrection. At a later time, Jesus showed himself to me, and he birthed me as an apostle. Verse 9, I am the least of the apostles. I do not even deserve to be called an apostle. Why, Paul? Because I persecuted the church of God. Before I became a believer in Jesus, out of my religious background, I would arrest and capture Christians. I would torment them, and I would kill them. And yet, by what? By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. In other words, the gift that Jesus offered me to change my life, I did not throw it away. It's an important question for you to ask. God has shown his grace to you even simply by being here today to hear this particular message. Not my words, but Paul's message. That is an opportunity of grace that's been extended to you as it was to Paul on a road called Damascus where God showed up and said, hey, what are you fighting me for? And on that day, Paul said, I will not fight you anymore. I will receive your grace. If you refuse God's grace, then his grace has no effect in your life. It must be received. No, I work harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. 
But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? They start changing their minds. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. For if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Useless faith. More than that, we are then to be found false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep, died in Christ, are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or died. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as Adam, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, the second coming, then the end will come, and he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he put all his enemies under his feet. What's the last enemy he will face? Verse 26 answers that question. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when was it destroyed? Resurrection morning that we call Easter. For he has put everything under his feet. And now when he says that everything has been put under his feet, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all and in all. Now the next two verses are the ones that create scratching of heads. Now if there is no resurrection, what will those who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? i got to be honest, I wish verse 29 just wasn't there. Let me pause for a moment because I don't want to just run right over it and say, well, he's ignoring the hard stuff. This one particular verse is the one verse that the Mormon church hangs their hat on for baptizing for dead ancestors. See, within the context of the Mormon church, there is not salvation by grace. There is salvation by works, by works alone in adherence to their doctrine. And this one verse is why they get buried for all their, that's why they trace, that's where Ancestry.com really came from. It's so they can keep tracing their lineage so they can be baptized more and more times for other members of their family who were not baptized in the doctrine of the Mormon church. And the more that they get done, the potentially higher level of heaven they will get and the greater rewards they will enjoy. And it hinges from that one verse right there, baptized for the dead. Understand, Paul is not endorsing that. You do not find anywhere else in Scripture any reference to being baptized for the dead. We also must remember, baptism is not salvation. We will have baptism next Sunday here. The 17 people who are currently going to be baptized are not being baptized to be saved. It is because they have been saved that they are being baptized. It is not through the work of baptism that we are saved. It is because of the obedience of our faith that we have expressed in Jesus Christ that we have become a Christian, that we are taking the next step of obedience, baby step of obedience in baptism, an identification with Jesus Christ. But this church, what did I say about this church in my opening comments? They were messed up. Lots of other things were coming in to the church from other cultures and their community, this being one of them. And so Paul, being a brilliant orator that he is, sometimes uses the circumstances of the situation to make a connection to Jesus, as he did at Mars Hill when in Ephesus he stood at the city in the park where all the gods, they, they had a statue to every god they could imagine. And they worshiped all of them. And the last one, they were, so, uh, they were so worried they would forget a god that they made a statue to the unknown god. And so Paul took that advantage at Ephesus, and he stood by the statue of the unknown god, and he said, this is the god I want to preach to you about, and I want to make him known to you. 
And so Paul was a master at taking things that people grappled with and making a connection to the truth. And he said, why are you baptizing ancestors for the dead so that they can be resurrected if you don't believe in the resurrection? He was using their own crazy logic to illustrate something here. And then he gets right back to the subject of the resurrection. All right. And as for us, in other words, I haven't been being baptized for the dead. What have I been doing? Sharing the gospel to a point that my life has been endangered every hour. I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beats in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised... And then he addresses a problem of this church in Corinth who are living under a very hedonistic principle. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Let's party today because everything ends tomorrow. He said, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses. Stop being stupid. That's the Tim Rowland modern translation. Stop sinning. For there are some of you who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. You know, we often say to people, I don't want to be hurtful. (laughs) Paul just says, what you're doing is shameful. But somehow, someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives it its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind, animals another, birds another, fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly body is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly body is another. And the sun has one kind of splendor, and the moon another, and the stars another, and the stars differ from star to star in their splendor. So it will be the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual one. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that is Jesus, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual... The first man was of the dust of the earth and the second from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. I declare to you, brothers, and he also means sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, die, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O grave, or death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It won't be wasted. John, who wrote the gospel and the revelation, also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And in 1st John 3, 2, he wrote these words, Dear friend, we're already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. Men, if somebody told you in heaven you're going to have the body of the rock, (laughs) most of us would probably like that. Ladies, I'm not even going to attempt to say who you might want, but just imagine. I'm, I'm not even going there. What I've discovered in the last few years 
is that growing old is not for the faint of heart, especially if you have a faint heart. I'm discovering that with age comes ailments and aches and a few extra pounds. As the humor columnist of the past, Irma Bombeck, grew older, she said something along these lines. She said, I'm not telling you what I weigh anymore, but when I measure my girth and then I step on the scales, I ought to be a 90-foot redwood. (laughs) For many of us, the battle of the bulge was a minor squirmish in our 20s. It became a total war in our 40s and our 50s. And if it wasn't the bulge, it was something else we fought, like wrinkles or sags and bags. Those of you on the other side of 55, have you ever gotten out of the shower and just stared at yourself in a full-length mirror lately? I don't even turn the light on in the bathroom until I'm dressed. For those of us at a certain age, it's a rather unnerving sight. If you haven't done it in a while, just try it. It'll jolt you awake like an electric shock. One overriding thought is going to fill your mind. You know what? I still got everything I always had. It's just a little lower than where it used to be. Let's not kid ourselves. Our bodies are not the bodies we had in high school or when we first got married. Although, you know, it's you standing in front of that mirror, even though you don't hardly recognize yourself. If you're going to a high school reunion, you wonder whether anybody else is going to recognize you, and you are so glad they put your high school graduation picture on your name tag. One, so you know who you are, and number two, you know who they are. Uh, Let's be honest, most of us don't grow old gracefully. Hearing loss, huh? Fading eyesight, creaking joints, those accompany our advancing years. Getting older reminds me of what Jesus said to Peter. He said, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. It's truth, isn't it? If and when we get to that stage described by Jesus, we'll hardly recognize ourselves anymore, nor will those who knew us in the vibrancy of our youth. When it comes to the next life, we are naturally curious about who we will be in heaven. Will we be ourselves? And which self will we be? The young, energetic one or the old, rather lethargic one? Will we recognize friends and family? Will they recognize us? And which version of us will they know? Intriguing questions. However, before we answer them completely, it's important to understand some important truths about the resurrection of the dead. Will everyone who dies receive a resurrected body? At funerals, I sometimes hear people say things like, that really isn't Mary in the casket. That's only her shell. The real Mary, her spirit is in heaven. This is the last time we'll ever see Roger in this body. It's natural to say things like that because we know our earthly bodies are temporal and our spirits are eternal. However, those realities have led many Christians to some wrong conclusions, that there is this dichotomy between our body what some believe are the only appearance of who we are, and our spirits, what they also believe are the reality of who we are. They believe that since we have left our earthly bodies behind at death, that we will exist in heaven forever as disembodied spirits. Uh, I want to suggest to you that nothing can be further from the truth. and the new heaven and the new earth, we will not exist as sanctified versions of Casper the Friendly Ghost. Do, do, Do you know who Casper the Friendly Ghost is? Okay, okay, good. I didn't know if he was still around, all right? Um, I asked a high school kid in the 8 o'clock service, and she said, I saw him once, okay? I used to watch him every morning for 30 minutes, all right? But that's not who we're going to be in eternity. Just as we possess physical bodies in this world, we will exist and relate to physical bodies in the next. And how do I know that? Consider how God designed us and what his plans for us are. 
Throughout this series, we've seen that heaven is primarily the recreation of the original heaven and earth, Eden, earth, as God originally designed it. If that is true, then it seems reasonable to assume that the residents of the new earth will exist in a similar fashion as the original occupants of Eden. When we turn to Genesis 2, we find a very interesting statement about God's creation of the first couple. Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground. The physical came first. And then he breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living being. When God created Adam and later Eve, he fashioned them as physical beings into whom he placed his spirit, making each person a living being. Notice that a person needed both a body and a spirit to be considered a living being. Without the physical body, he or she would not be a being, and without a spirit, he or she would not be living. God created Adam and every person since his body, soul, and spirit of course, there's a time coming when every human being will have his or her spirit separated from the physical body. The word death in the Greek, it means to separate, to rip apart. Death is the separation of our spirit from the physical bodies. And as we saw earlier in one of the previous sermons, at that moment of separation, a Christian immediately goes to be in the presence of the Lord. That's what the Bible says, absent from the body, immediately present with God. While the spirit of a non-Christian goes immediately to Hades that we looked at the last couple of weeks, that's their temporary place of torment until they go to the lake of fire. But how long will that separation of body and spirit last? Are you ready for a very profound answer? I don't know. I don't know. The Bible says only God knows the day and the hour in which Jesus Christ will come again. And it's at that moment with a great trumpet sound that the the physical bodies which have died will be raised from the dead and be reunited with their spirits. And I don't know when that's going to be, but I'm not really worried about it. The theologians over the centuries have believed that during this time we are spirit, but that's okay because God says he is spirit and those who worship him will worship him how? In spirit and in truth, and somehow, even in this form, we will be recognizable to him and to each other. I don't know the details to that. There are some other details I do know. Here is one thing we know for sure, that in the future, every Christian and non-Christian will receive a new physical body that is designed to experience the eternal pleasures of heaven or the forever torments of hell. The scripture repeatedly talks about the resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. For example, Job believed he could see God with his own physical eyes when he declared in Job 19.26, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. Daniel believed the same thing when he wrote in 12.2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground died and are buried. They will awake, these believers, to everlasting life, but the others, non-believers, to disgrace and everlasting contempt. How is a physical resurrection possible? 1 Corinthians 15 is the most complete explanation of this that we just read. Anticipating objections to a physical resurrection, the Apostle Paul writes, someone will say, how are the dead raised? Maybe you've wondered the same thing. I want to be sensitive here for just a moment. But I've often been asked over the years about those whose bodies have been destroyed in fire or accident or tragedies like 911 in 2001. How can their disintegrated bodies be resurrected? Or consider the passengers in an airliner that explodes over the ocean and the bodies of dismembered passengers are submerged in the water only to be eaten by sea creatures. How about Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island? This is an interesting story. When he died, he was buried in Rhode Island at the foot of an apple tree. They wanted to dig up his body, disinter his body, so they could put it in a place where more people could visit the one who founded Rhode Island. And yet when they dug him up, remember, in those days, they didn't have metal caskets like we have now. These were probably soft wood caskets. When they dug him up, the roots of that apple tree had penetrated through the wood of the casket. It had grown through the top of his skull, branched out through his arms and his legs. The tree had literally consumed William's body, getting nourishment from his body as the tree grew. How is Roger William's body ever going to be resurrected? Consider what happens to the person who at death donates part of his body. I've, if there's anything in my body worth having, I've told him, use it with somebody else. How can that person ever reclaim 
His or her vital organs, if an eye went to Ann Ethel and a kidney was donated to Uncle Sidney. This puts Paul's question in 1 Corinthians 15.35 into a new light, doesn't it? How does a, a body scattered in a number of different ways get back? <laughs> John Calvin, the theologian, answered this question pretty succinctly when he said, since God has all of the elements at his disposal, no difficulty will prevent him from commanding the earth, the fire, the water, or the wind to give up whatever's been destroyed. Then Paul gives us an analogy of planting and harvesting. Paul answered his own question with this, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies, and that which you sow you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something, and God gives a body just as he which wishes to each of the seeds of the body its own. Before a watermelon seed ever produces a watermelon, it must first be placed in the ground where that seed dies and then springs to life. And at harvest, you don't harvest watermelon seeds. You harvest something much better, ripe watermelons. The harvest is always superior to what was planted. So it is with the resurrection. When we die, our human bodies are like seeds planted in the ground. The death of our human bodies, regardless of how it occurs, is not a hindrance to future resurrection, but it's a prerequisite to a greater harvest. Why? Notice what Paul said. That which you sow does not come to life until it dies. And Paul goes on to explain our old bodies must die. They're not designed for eternity. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Paul said, nor does the perishable put on imperishable. While our body is perfectly designed for planet Earth, it is not suited for Mars or Pluto or heaven. That is why we should not view death as the end of something great, but as the beginning of something greater. The body we receive at harvest time, the resurrection, is superior to the body that is planted in the ground. Think of it this way. Imagine a scorching summer day, 100 degrees in the shade. You've been outside in the yard to cool down. You come in the house. You open the refrigerator for something refreshing. What would you rather sink your teeth into? A slice of ice-cold watermelon or an ice-cold watermelon seed? Similarly, when our bodies are resurrected from the grave, it will not be our old bodies, but it will be the recreation of what was old into something brand new, just like a new heaven and a new earth, a new body, superior to the seed, but similar to the seed. You don't plant a watermelon and then get a kumquat. A watermelon produces a watermelon, and so our bodies, the body of Tim Rowland, will produce through the power of God, a resurrected version of Tim Rowland. We should look closely at the resurrected body of Jesus Christ if we want to discover what our bodies will be like in the new heaven and the new earth. And so next Sunday, we're going to look at what was the resurrected body of Jesus like. And there's a lot of evidence in the Bible for us to gar garnish truth from. And when we see what his was like, we will discover what ours will be like. Well, that's not exactly where I wanted to end today, but it's where we're going to finish today. These kind of sermons are always frustrating for me because I always love to end at a moment where you can make a choice, where you can make a decision. We're not quite there yet. So what this means is every one of you have to come back next week for part two. And you have to tell those who weren't here today, go listen to it online. Some of you may be guests for the very first time and you said, what kind of church is this? I will tell you, this is a church that believes exactly what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. We do not want to leave those matters of first importance. The life of Jesus that qualified him to die the death that he died so that he could be raised again from the dead. And the death that he died was for the forgiveness of our sins. And the resurrected life was for our daily living between now until we go to heaven so that we can enjoy heaven for all eternity. That's the things of first importance. Do you believe that? Then I hope God's grace has not been wasted and that you have personally invited Christ to live in your life. If you want to know more about that, you can call the office, you can fill out a card, or you can simply say, Lord Jesus, come live within my life. I don't know all this resurrection stuff very well yet, but I know one day I'm going to die, and when I do, 
I want to know I'm going to be with you. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for your presence here today and help us understand the things that are a little bit more challenging, things we don't normally like to grapple with. Give us a willingness to know that our future is greater than our past and it will make a difference in the way we live in the present. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day. Come back at 5.